Good evening, everybody. Just waiting for everybody to file in before we get underway, but um, welcome all. Just a few more moments and we'll get started. Okay. Right. Well, welcome everybody to the first RFS book club, um, which we hope will be one of uh, the first of many. Um, before we get underway, um, just a few quick points on housekeeping. Um, for, for the time being, whilst we're talking to Fiona and we're in conversation, if you could keep yourselves muted, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, when we come to the Q&A, we will be asking you to, to contribute and put your questions directly to Fiona. So we'll come to you one by one and ask you to switch your audio on as, as needed. But for the time being, if you could keep it muted, that would be wonderful. Um, if you have questions for Fiona, just pop them in the chat function so that we know you want to ask one and then we can come to you later on. We will do our absolute utmost to get them all answered. We have had a few submitted in advance, but we'll work through them all and do our, do our utmost to get them all covered off. Um, and finally, just to let you know, we are recording the session. Um, afterwards, we'll email you a link so you can watch it again if you'd like to. Um, and also on that email, there'll be an opportunity to give us a little bit of feedback and potentially suggest ideas of um, authors or books that you might like us to run a session on in the future. So hope that's all okay and hope you enjoy the next hour of conversation. And with that, I will pass over to Wendy to get us started. Thank you, Claire, and a huge welcome to everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'll just run through the format for this evening and then we'll, we'll start to talk to Fiona. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the concept. I'll introduce Fiona, ask her a couple of questions, invite her to give us a little bit of a reading, and then we'll start to invite questions in. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm Wendy Neckar. I'm the communications officer for the RFS. There are certainly some names who've already joined us who I recognize. So, so hello to some friendly faces and hello to those who I haven't had a ch chance to meet yet. Uh, the concept for the book club is to bring uh, members, RFS members together from across the country. As Claire has said, we hope perhaps to hold three or four a year. All topics will be related to trees and woodlands in some form or another. As the, and as we develop, we hope that you'll contribute some ideas yourself, authors you might like to hear from, um, and books that you have enjoyed. Tonight is just RFS members, and we will be opening it occasionally to other, others as well. But as tonight is so special as our first one, uh, welcome to our members. So I'm going to, to um, introduce Fiona now. Some of you may have met Fiona already if you went to the uh, RFS Evolving the Forest Conference. So Fiona, it's a great welcome back to um, an RFS event. And thank you so, so much for being our first, first inaugural author to talk to us. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Fiona. You may already know this, so bear with me but she is a professor of English at Oxford University. She's the author of many books, including uh, a biography of Jane Austen. And you may well have heard her on Radio 3 as the author of the highly acclaimed uh, The Meaning of Trees. So the book that we're discussing tonight, which I hope you've all had a, had a look at, The Long, Long Life of Trees, uh, you can still apply um, through our link for a discount if you haven't, haven't already. Uh, but this was the Sunday Times Nature Book of the Year, and it's a book which has been described as a grafting of art, law and literature that logs our lives with natural wonders. So, Fiona, <laughs> in the tradition of all great authors and classic <laughs> novels, you had me at that very first paragraph. I just loved that tactile description of a pine cone on your desk, the size of a sparrow with its rough woody flakes and the memories of holidays that it brought back to you. So I'm gonna start with a very simple question for you. Well, I think it's simple, but it may well not be. Um, was there a moment in time when you knew you just had to write this book? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And before we start, I'll show you because the advantage of Zoom is that I am in 
my writing room so I can actually show you the very the very point that inspires me and that I continue to kind of hold in my hold in my hand when I need to feel in touch with the outside when I'm writing um, in terms of writing this book um, I think it's a book I have always wanted to write I think I've been writing about trees all my life since I was a child but it, it took me a long time to this realised that anyone else might be interested in what I had to say about trees. So it's when this happy, um, happy uh, discovery landed on me when I wrote the first of the radio programmes, because I was invited to, you know, pitch some ideas and Radio 3 really liked the idea of, of, of a series about trees. And then because the response to that was so was so very encouraging that made me feel uh, emboldened to, to write write the book. Uh, so I suppose that was the moment where this book really got off the ground, but I've been interested in trees all my life. And as I say, writing about them. And then another impetus um, was uh, in my, you know, my, my day job, which is working on English literature and, and teaching students. And it became very apparent to me um, that in lots of the texts we would be discussing in a, in a class or a seminar or a tutorial, uh, there were references to wood and trees um, by writers who just assumed that their readers would understand the connotations of these trees, what they meant, what the wood was used for. Uh, and it was very apparent that my students uh, on the whole were very, very vague about about trees. So I started sort of telling them a little bit about them. And it, it, it occurred to me that this was this was knowledge that had been very, very widespread uh, and just taken for granted uh, until maybe um, well, maybe the 60s, but certainly up until the, the Second World War and, and has now actually receded. I mean, I'm, I think now with the interest in ecology and the environment growing, uh, there's, there's a marvellous revival of interest. And that's that's very exciting. Um, but but that was that was another kind of spur to, to, to encourage me to write the book. Well, I for one, I'm absolutely delighted that you did. Um, <laughs> I'm going to quote, uh, read a quote, uh, Fiona, um, that I think you said, and then I'm going to invite you, if you would, just to read us a little piece from the book. So um, I think you said this, or you were certainly quoted as saying this. I worked on the principle that if I found something surprising, someone else probably would too. What might be obvious to a botanist or a forester or a local historian can still be a revelation to the rest of us. So my big question to you really is what surprised you most in your research? And perhaps you could just um, read a little bit to illustrate that. Well, thank you very much. Um, what surprised me? Well, there are so many surprises. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult to choose one. Um, I mean, I learned so much um, doing research for the, for the book. I mean, my starting point in a way was, was English literature. Um, but I quickly started reading all sorts of other books, books, um, you know, bot botany, um, books about forestry, uh, books about building, all, all kinds of things about, about the history of the landscape. Um, and I was constantly surprised. And a lot of, a lot of modern science as well, for, for example, um, fairly recent discovery about uh, the way pine trees uh, are exuding this amazing aerosol and creating their own cloud cover, um, which can act as a, as a, as a, as a, as a great mirror uh, shielding a forest from, from the sun and the implications of that for global warming. Those kind of things um, I, I just find uh, remarkable. Um, and, and, you know, they seem to be a sort of uh, something that trees keep revealing and, and new surprises about them. But I think in terms of things that have made a really personal impact, um, it would be personal encounters with trees. Um, I, and a lot of the time I was taking, uh, I, I went to go and see trees that I might have come across in art or reading or seen a photograph. Um, and it was very interesting to me to go and see whether they were still there and whether they were still recognisable. So I suppose one of the most surprising experiences I had was um, visiting yew trees. Um, I, I was absolutely astonished to discover how how long lived <laughs> yew trees can be. Um, and, and I've been to see some of the oldest um, yew trees uh, in the country. Um, 
And I'll read you a little bit about uh, a particularly moving experience uh, that I had in the Lake District um, and also um, how that you know, moves on to a yew tree in another part of the country. So I'll just read you a little bit from the, the chapter on the yew. Um, I should say that this these were yew trees that I'd been familiar with from my reading for a long time because Wordsworth wrote a, a, a poem um, about, about yew trees, which I'm very fond of. And he talks about different yew trees in the Lake District. And one of the one of the groups he talks about are the Borrowdale yews. And he, he calls them the fraternal four. Um, so I was looking for four big yew trees and um, luckily I had no old OS map where they were marked so that helped a lot but they're, they're not far from Derwent Water and they're, they're above the Derwent and I'll just read you a little bit. Um, so the Fraternal Four um, no longer stand as square as they did when Wordsworth visited them because one of them was blown down in a gale in 1883. The ancient yews are still the most enigmatic presences in this underpopulated valley, silent as stone, and yet exuding an air that is not uplifting, but neither quite melancholy. A stillness so deep that even breathing seems intrusive. When I tried to photograph the Borodell yews under the bright sunlight of an August afternoon, my camera broke. Photographs often do preserve personal histories of yews better than anything. And some trees now survive only as images in old postcards. Antique photographs can show an ancient tree prior to the loss of a major branch, or indeed after significant modification. Victorian pictures of the Crowhurst yew in Surrey reveal that what's perhaps its most startling feature, the little door in the trunk, was already in place, but the tree was listing less violently than it does today. When I visited the Crowhurst yew, the door was hanging open as if the last tenant had gone out in a hurry. But once closed, the dignity of the ancient tree was rapidly regained. Above the door, where two branches must have fallen off at some point, the hollows are unsettlingly like great eye sockets blind to the agitations of the present moment. And yet, in that unfocused gaze, capable of seeing much further. When the Ewart Crowhurst was being domesticated in the early 19th century, its craggy interior fitted out with a neat table and chairs and the little door, which is still there, fixed to the trunk, a cannonball was uncovered. It had been lodged there during the Civil War and had lain undisturbed ever since. Yew trees are living monuments shaped by human history and packed with all manner of surprising revelations. So that's just a, just a little bit of um, personal experience of surprising encounters at ancient yew trees. And, and after the book was published and I carried on obviously reading and thinking about trees, I, I discovered in um, the poet John Clare's diary uh, a reference uh, to the Crowhurst yew. He, he, he talks about how they've discovered this cannonball <laughs> in, inside the yew tree. Um, so that's, that's a sort of revelation to, to a poet in the 1820s. Um, and, and it just struck me as really interesting the way this ancient tree, which was still there, I mean, I just turned up one afternoon and there it was standing in the churchyard as, as they do, um, had been adapted and had been surprising people um, for already for hundreds of years and probably hundreds of years before John Clare read about it or they decided to fit this fit this little door in it. Um, so that, that's, that's an example of the, the great pleasure of researching a book like this. You, you have constant um, surprises of this kind. Oh, that's, that's just fabulous. I, I've often thought as I've gone past the big old trees, what could they tell us? Who's walked beneath them before me? And it is just, it just is wonderful. Um, so now I think that we'll, we'll turn to Claire. Um, she's going to ask one of our submitted questions. We've got a few coming in on the chat line now. So Claire and I will alternate. But if you want to ask a question, please do, do put your, your question in the chat line and we'll be coming to you. Uh, so, yeah, over to you, Claire. Hi, Fiona. So the first of the uh, questions we had submitted in advance is, how did you choose the 17 species for the book? 
And was it hard to decide which to put in and which to leave out? Uh, yeah, it was very hard to decide, actually. Um, my initial, um, my starting point really was that I wanted to write about uh, trees that are quite apparently ordinary, you know, familiar, familiar trees, uh, and then point out how no tree is ordinary and how extraordinary they are. So, um, you know, something like a a rowan tree or a, or a mountain ash that many people will see in a in a suburban street has this absolutely kind of astonishing um, uh, background, if you like, or back backstory. It's got all these associations of protection against against witches. Uh, it's got all sorts of properties. So so that was that was what was um, guiding my thinking. I mean, you know, I was thinking now, what, which are trees that most people will have heard of? Um, even if they wouldn't necessarily uh, be able to uh, identify one. I mean, present company <laughs> excluded, of course, because everybody here knows a lot about trees, but you will also know um, that across across the world and across the country, not, not everybody does know a huge amount about, uh, about British trees. Um, so I was interested in, in, you know, familiar trees rather than very exotic or unusual ones. Um, and then different kinds of trees, because I was also thinking uh, of, 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 a, of a book that was going to be interesting to read. So although I absolutely love big broad leaves, I didn't just want to write about, about broad leaves. Um, and it's partly why I started off with a yew tree, because um, I think when, if you are somebody, so if you're playing Pictionary, for example, and you're trying to draw a tree, uh, because that's, <laughs> that's part of a word or something, um, People don't draw a yew tree, they would tend to draw, there's a particular kind of symbol that everybody immediately goes for. So I wanted to start off with something that wouldn't be their obvious idea of a tree, but would also be one that's that's very familiar and, and people would recognise it as soon as you point, pointed it out. Um, and, and the reason I wanted 17 is because it's such a sort of unusual number of chapters. I mean, you, everybody tends to think in terms of 12 or 10 or 15. Um, uh, and, and I thought all oh, 17 a prime number that's that's nice and sort of true so so it was it's really I mean part of this book is just is is fun you know when I'm writing I like to write something that I'm enjoying so um I, I was uh I, I was trying to be a little bit contrary so that's why I started with you and ended with the apple because the obvious place to start would be with a is for apple but I wanted to end with that um so so I don't know if that's a very good answer to your question um but um th those are those are those are my reasons and and I did also want to write about trees that had that there was lots to say about um so uh, all of them have had lots of attention from writers and people in different ways over, over the centuries um so some of them have lots of folk beliefs clustering around them um a lot of them in fact um or uh, and many of them their wood is used for very particular things and has been for a long time though those uses change i mean the ash tree is a very good example of that it's uh, uh, or, or the willow. I mean, they, they've been used by human beings um, for a very long time in very different ways. And I was struck by how often the physical properties of trees, what we might think of the, as their practical um, aspects, uh, often um, tie up with their uh, mythological or uh, folkloric um, associations as well. So, so I was interested in trees that that um have those different aspects though it turned out the more <laughs> the more reading and the more thinking and the more talking I did uh, it turned out that most trees do actually so so this book could have been much much longer um but um I sort of got to 17 and thought yeah that we'll see how this goes <laughs> enough for a sequel <laughs> thank you Fiona I think um we'll move now to the first uh question on the chat function and again a reminder to people don't be shy put your questions up there so the first on my list for, is um, Keith Kirby, who um, I think many of you will know. Um, Keith, if you'd like to unmute yourself and put your camera on and ask your question. Yeah, I was wondering whether you feel differently about individual trees or where, to when they're clustered in the wood. Um, yeah, is it, is it the individual shape or, or, or what? Um, 
I think no, I think that's a really that's a really interesting question. I mean, I I do find individual trees very interesting, and I think their shapes are very distinctive, uh, as you know, of course. Um, but I think I, I'm also very interested in trees trees in woods as well, uh, and, and I think different woods have very very different characters. Um, not far from where I live, one of my sort of morning walks is through a very small um wood and it's mostly it's mostly ash trees um and and it's obviously the remnant of a much older older forest because you can see that a lot of the um the ashes have been have been coppiced or or, or pollarded and the, the the massive massive sort of pollards with with little um thinner trunks growing up and i think it's incredibly sort of atmospheric so it's not that any of those trees individually um, have the kind of history that one of those ancient yews has, but collectively, uh, yeah, I think they're I think they're they're fascinating, and I and I always think that the atmosphere when you walk into a wood is so is so distinctive, and I think you know we're probably responding um, to the scent and the sounds and the you know the, the sort of air that is somehow trapped within a wood, and that and that is a very atmospheric experience and very different uh, from if you're kind of walking along and you just see one tree um, I, I mean I think I think trees <laughs> I think trees like to be together very often don't they so so yeah I, I think I think that's very interesting and, and as I say I think different woods have different characters depending on where they are and what species they are and how how spread out they are um, and, and that has a big effect on you know how many flowers there are what kinds of flowers all, all those kinds of questions and, and all the wildlife living there as well and, and, and the birds um, that, that's often as you know very different from what you might see in a more open space with one big oak or something does that answer your question keith or do you want to yes. come back to yeah, no, on that no, one it reminds it reminds this morning and I was in the wood this morning and it just felt the tree, the wood felt as though it was waiting for spring, but maybe that was just me putting <laughs> pressure. There was on. a lovely there was a lovely description. I think you had Fiona of your children um shouting every time you went down a particular road, oh skinny trees, skinny trees. Yeah, that, was, <laughs> well, that was poplar trees, exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay, we're back back to Claire with another submitted question. And again, do put your questions in on, on the chat function. So the, the next question is, how important were the illustrations and the design of the cover and the illustration on the cover um, uh, when it came to compiling the, the book? Well, I think they're a really important part of the book, um, but I certainly can't take um, full full credit for them. I mean, this is this is more the sort of the, the wood metaphor of, of 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 the growth of a book. Um, that there's quite a lot of different people involved, not just not just the one person writing it. Um, and I was very I was very lucky um, at Yale. The art editor Steve Kent. We work very closely together, um, and and. Um, um, I had thought that woodcuts and wood engravings would be the most appropriate, um, you know, most appropriate sort of illustrations for the book. So we we had quite a lot of those, but he he thought it would also be good to have some photographs and other kinds of illustrations as well, which which was was fine. And I think he did a brilliant job with the with the design. I mean, some of the photos are ones that I took. Um, in fact, most of the photos are, but um, <clears throat> uh, the other illustrations, they come from all sorts of different sources. And then the publisher um, commissioned this absolutely lovely uh, cover, which I had nothing to do with at all. I can take no credit for that, but I I absolutely love it. I think it's, I think it's fabulous. So I, I think it's all, you know, part of, um, part of the book and, and I, I, it also seems to be a great enhancement and what, what I really like are the end papers actually um, I don't think they're in the paperback but in the hardback there are these lovely lovely end papers um, which have the Y for Yale uh, but they're designed to look like a tree so I don't know if you've seen those you can see that in my copy um, and I, I think that I think they're really, really lovely because uh, because it's a book that is very attentive to 
to the past and to how things have grown up over the years. Some of those rather kind of traditional touches, I, I think, are a great enhancement. So that had absolutely nothing to do with me, and I'm very, very grateful to the publisher for that. Um, but but there are lots of references um, to, uh, to, to paintings and images in the book as well. So some of those are actually then reproduced and others aren't. Um, so that's quite in, that's quite interesting too. Um, so uh, not, not all the paintings I talk about are, are reproduced, but, but, but some of them are. Um, oh, and I should mention that there's one, uh, there's one illustration that was done by my husband as well, uh, a lovely uh, drawing of a, a horse chestnut. Um, so I was very delighted that that could go in, in too. So, so I think of this book as a, as a kind of collective, collective effort in, in, in many ways. That's, that's lovely. Um, I think we'll go to another of the chat room functions, uh, questions rather, and that's from Eve. Eve, if you can unmute yourself and put your camera on. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if there were, um, if you have sort of favourite authors that you think write particularly well about trees and woodlands? Um, yeah, I've got... Got so many favourite authors. It would take it would take quite a long quite a long time. Um, I mean, a lot of the people I think who write really well about about trees are are poets, um, and they write about them in different ways. I mean, I've mentioned words with poem about the yew trees, which is an absolutely astonishingly uh, well observed. Um, uh, account of yew trees, but very very beautiful as well. Um, but someone like John Clare, who was um, a, a poet who was who was working on the land, he kind of has a different relationship with with wood and uh, and trees, and he writes about them very well as well too. I mean, he, he uh, obviously responded very very powerfully to trees, so he has lovely um, poems about about trees. Um, but then, in terms of, in terms of novelists, I mean, someone like Thomas Hardy again. Um, rural rural novelist, uh, very great novelist. I mean, his his novel, The Woodlanders, would be the obvious one to talk about because it's very much set set in in the woods, um, and and he 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 describes the trees in extraordinary ways. I mean, it's a tragedy, so in many ways, it's quite a it's quite a gloomy sort of sort of book. Um, but his descriptions are so powerful and so beautiful and so felt. And he also has, he doesn't just have the, the timber trees, he also has um, details about um, the, the, the apples and the cider um, that's being made as well. When, when Giles Winterbourne goes, goes off and starts um, you know, taking his cider press around. So, so there's lots and lots of detail about the life of people who, who lived in a big wood in the 19th century. Um, and you just learn loads from it. I mean, my favourite bit is, um, is is Mr. South, who is the, I don't know if you know the novel, um, he, he's the father of a young woman who works planting trees and she works in, in the woodland. And her father, their cottage is, is right next to an enormous elm tree. Um, and Mr. South becomes quite ill because he's so convinced that the tree is going to, to land on his cottage. Um, and this has often been interpreted by, you know, kind of literary scholars as a, a sort of neurosis. Um, but actually, um, this was one of the things I found very interesting. When I learned more about elm trees um, and how they do suddenly just fall down or they suddenly a large branch will just crash down unexpectedly, you realise that actually Mr South has very good reason uh, for, for, his, for his anxiety. So it just put a whole kind of new complexion on the book. And, and, and Hardy was so well informed and so inward with with trees and forests, um, that he, he just writes brilliantly about it. Um, but I think if you if you want a if you want a much more contemporary novel, um, Richard Powers' um, new new novel, The Overstory, is is about trees, uh, and that's um, you know that that's that's a very kind of contemporary uh, contemporary take on it. Uh, so I, I'd I'd recommend both of those. Thank you. I um, The Woodlanders is one of my favourite novels, so thank oh, you. Oh, excellent. That that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've actually just only recently read that, so that was that was great. Um, Claire, before we go to another submitted question, Jez Ralph has um, a question which is um, related, very much related to what we've just been discussing. So, Jez, if you can turn yourself on, that's lovely. Thank you. Hi, Fiona. Hi, uh, Jez. I'm so. 
I suppose I'm interested um, in our cultural connections trees. And I suppose my journey into forestry was quite heavily influenced by Simon Sharma's book, Landscape and Memory. Mm -hmm. And you're in a unique position of having spent time amongst trees and written about them and returning to a day job rooted in literature. And so my question, do you think we have an innate connection with trees and woods or do you think our cultural connection with trees and woods is um, rooted in history and art and literature influences? Oh that well that's that's a really interesting question and um, yeah I, I think we do actually I, I think there's a very sort of such an ancient uh, connection between um, people and trees uh, that, that it's that it probably is an innate innate thing. I mean, they, they are the natural shelter um, for human beings, and they give us every, everything too. I mean, they, they give us um, they give us food, and they give us timber to keep you know keep 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 um, keep warm in the winter. They they do kind of supply everything. So so it seems to me they're a very uh, natural companion um for 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 human beings um but but i think it, it, it's interesting because i've been fortunate i've always um always had access to trees since i was since i was a child um whether in in gardens or um you know just just outside in the in the country so i've always had a very sort of strong sense of wanting to be trees it's probably something about me being very under evolved i always had a very strong urge to climb into a tree as, as as a child um but i don't think that was true of, of of all children and i'm often told that this is odd odd behavior for a girl as well um but that may be kind of cultural conditioning that starts very early on that this is not sort of ladylike behavior or whatever um but I, 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 yeah, no, I, I, th I think, I think there is this sort of strong natural affinity with trees, which comes out in different forms, um, and then it has been, you know, kind of much enhanced by culture. Um, so it's not just literature and art; um, it, it's also religious as well. I mean, I, th I think the kind of the number of different religions across the world um, in which trees play an important role, or they did traditionally, and and in kind of ancient world beliefs a, a tree is often central um, that that seems to me a different aspect of that basic survival um, impulse um, so so I think I think it's probably goes right right back in evolutionary terms but is also really really important um, in, in in religion and belief systems uh, and then literature and art and stories uh, so, so that that's why I'm so sort of troubled by um, the way trees seem to kind of recede um, in the 20th century, and I'm hoping very much that, that that's now being <laughs> that's now being addressed, which I think it is. There's a great deal of interest in trees, but one of the things that struck me just in terms of of stories, um, I've recently been reading an awful lot of short stories about trees uh, because I'm editing a collection uh, of, of stories about about trees and forests and things. I'm not writing them; I'm just just um, choosing them, and I was very interested in how often in children's literature trees are everywhere and it's perfectly normal to be interested in the squirrel's eye view or whatever and then somehow when you get to grown-up <laughs> grown-up um, books or stories um, tre trees uh, seem to seem to recede into the background so in a children's story you could have a tree that's actually um, center stage like the faraway tree or whatever uh, and there are animals who who live in trees and that's all that's you know they're, they're all taken seriously and it's their it's their point of view but then as as people get older in older fiction um that's seen as sort of somehow childish in the same way that fairy stories are, are seen as, ch as as childish um and i i think that is something that it would be very good if that if that modified um a, a little bit if, if that makes sense I, th I think I think all those children's stories where where trees are really important and people are living in the woods for what sort of, all sorts of reasons that they also you know kind of enhance our sense of trees I, it's fascinating isn't it the trees can be a safe place of safety and haven in some literature and a place of terror in 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 others yeah well, it's really interesting because some of these stories that I, I've been reading, because I'm very fond of trees, as you know, I've been reading 
kind of quite disturbed by how for some writers obviously they are they are frightening and threatening and as you say woods are places of of, of fear primarily um so so you know it, it is interesting how people have these quite powerful reactions to them but not not always positive by by any means um so I think what you two have brought up leads us very nicely into a question from Simon. Um, Simon, do you think you could unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, hello. Um, hello. I, I, I'm really wondering whether um, you're alone in the world of uh, English literature uh, academia who would be writing about uh, trees, or whether there's a, a body of research uh, uh, or rich tradition of uh, writing about uh, trees in in English and their, and their role in English literature. Um, well, I don't think there are a lot of critical books about trees in English in English literature, or, or indeed the natural world generally. I mean, there are other people who do the same sort of job as me who write about the natural world. I mean, Rob McFarlane is an obvious example, um, who is a, a, a English professor in Cambridge and writes many, you know, many very, very successful books about, about the natural world and the, and the landscape. Um, but actually writing about trees and trees in literature, there, there, there aren't that many, there aren't that many books really. Um, so I am encouraging people to um, <laughs> to take up, I, I've invented a new term which is called dendro criticism <laughs> and I'm hoping that more people will will rush to to, to, to uh, explore um, explore trees. But it is it, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've been teaching um, uh, a graduate course on on nature writing this this term and it's striking how students feel a bit underconfident about writing about trees they tend to say well i don't know much about trees so i'm a bit uneasy about talking about this even or, or thinking about it and, and that's the thing that i think it would be helpful to to overcome um because because trees are just and everywhere um, in, in in literature, because um, so many writers have always been so interested in them, and, and they they have all these kind of metaphorical um, possibilities. Uh, so so they they you know they they feature they feature everywhere. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of writing on on trees in their symbolic sense, usually in their political sense. So, for example. Um, the debate over the French Revolution, uh, you know, whether ancient oaks mean a sort of conservative Burkean position, um, and whether poplar trees mean the French tree of liberty, that that kind of political iconography, there is quite a lot of work on, and the, the royal oak that um, Charles II um, promoted so much. Uh, but in general, actually, just writing about Hardy's poems about trees or Edward Thomas's poems about trees, um, I think, uh, you know, there's a bit of a dearth actually, but but it's it's growing, it's growing. <laughs> so is, is there a, a, a DPhil or PhD opportunity here for someone to do uh, a, a, on on dendro critic, critic, criticism? <laughs> I think there definitely is. I think I think many actually, uh, and, and you know, modern modern poets, Seamus Heaney, for example, is absolutely brilliant on trees. He, he there's lots and lots of trees in his poem. So um, you know, it's it's a very very rich topic. It's it's a it's a topic um, with multiple possibilities. Many details, I think. <laughs> thank you. Lovely, thank you, uh, Claire. Do we have another submitted question you want to ask? Yes, we have one, um, which is. Is there anything that you've since found out about any of the species, which, if you'd known it at the time of writing, you would want to include now? Oh yeah, there's absolutely loads. <laughs> um, you know, I could I could sort of do a revised edition, which would be twice the length because I've I've learned so so much. Um, so it would be where to start really. Well, things like discovering the reference to the cannon ball in 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 John Clare's journal was um, you know just one of those things I found. But um, very often when I'm talking to people about trees, they will say, "Oh well, did you know that?" And of course, I never do. So I'm always being told things, which is great, um, which is why I like me foresters so much and people are interested in in forestry um but one one interesting recent um thing that i would definitely have included um is um a, a dutch um person who who i'm i met at a, a, an event in in oxford which was about trees 
um, was telling me about how he had his own his own tree, uh, and it's a it's a custom in the Netherlands to plant a tree for a new baby. Um, and I think traditionally the idea was that that was a sort of um, investment for the future, so that you know once they were once they were an adult, if it's a fast growing species um, like a willow, um, it would it would provide them with with with, with wood and timber if they wanted uh, if they wanted to. But but now it's more a sort of sentimental thing. Um, but that just seemed to me a really really nice um custom and apparently quite 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 wide widespread um and i've had, i've had people write to me with that with you know tales of particular uses in in different in different countries um it's interesting um one of the more, more moving things that that i received was uh, a message from someone in dresden who had picked up my book and seen um, the image of, of the, 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 the Dresden lime tree. Um, and, and then she wrote to me and told me about trees in Dresden and any older tree in Dresden um, is obviously revered because the, the war damage was so comprehensive that an awful lot of their trees like the buildings um, were, were, were raised to the ground. So, so that is something I would definitely have wanted to to to, to write about as well. Um, so so it, it's just it's just very interesting what people so generously <laughs> write and tell me about, um, and and that I come across of course as well when I'm out and about. And I've also managed to go and visit lots more um, trees since the book came out. Um, so a tree like the Deffenog yew, which I hadn't been able to get to when I wrote the book, I knew about it, but I hadn't actually seen it. Um, I managed to go and see that. It's it's, um, it's near the land of free in, in central Wales, and it is absolutely massive. I'm sure lots of you have been there, but if not, it is the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. It's um, you know, it's sort of bigger than the church that uh, uh, in, in the yard where it where it stands. So so I I you know continue to go and visit trees all the time. And the other thing is um, that some of the trees you write about, they then they then aren't there anymore. I mean, this is this is the sort of thing about trees. They are alive, um, and and they you know they blow down or they get diseased or they get cut down. Um, so you have to kind of keep checking <laughs> to see whether they're still whether they're still there or not. Um. Thank you, Fiona. Um, we have a question from Robin Water. Robin, if you'd like to unmute yourself and come in. It's also a question which you might like to put to our next book club as well. So we'll see, see how Fiona goes with this one. The next book club, just to plug that, is Keith. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes, so uh, Fiona, um, you, you've chronicled uh, beautifully our relationship with trees through the centuries. Um, and I suppose my question is looking forward, um, how will trees and woods in our landscape change over the next 50 years and how will we feel about this? We People generally like trees but we really want lots more. Um, do we prefer big open spaces? Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah well that's um, that is a very interesting question and I should imagine lots of people here would have have things to say about that. Um, I think I think more trees are a good thing, um, but I think the question of which trees and where and what effect that's going to have on the landscape um, is something um, that will require an awful lot of careful thought, um, because I think, you know, when landscapes are suddenly changed dramatically, it, it can be quite troubling for people, even if they're being told that oh yes well thousands of years ago this is what your landscape looked like actually if for the last 300 years it hasn't looked like that people are going to find that perhaps unsettling so I think it, it does need to be done with great sensitivity and discussion with with um with local local people as well and I think you know which which uh which species are planted where is is an important one I mean obviously all of these questions um will depend on resilience and climate change and all the rest and which species will grow in particular places as, as the you know the the climate in this country uh, and the conditions are, are unpredictable I think over the next hundred years um, but um, I, I think thought is going into into all of that but things like the northern forest I imagine there are areas where that is being planted and planned uh, where it, it'll be very welcome and in other places people might be quite 
quite troubled by it. I mean, I, I think if the Yorkshire Dales are completely planted with trees, um, you know, there the will be people who are who are up, up, upset by that because it's not the landscape that they that they know and love and think of as as home. So, so I think in terms of um, climate change, carbon capture. Um, air pollution all of these things um having lots more trees is a good thing and i think for things like flood defenses there's lots and lots of things that i think trees are a marvelous kind of remedy for often the traditional methods are really really good but i do think that there it, it does need to be um thought through and i think the aesthetic qualities and people's cultural associations with particular landscapes are important and, and also the implications for um, the, the farmers who've lived there for, for years and have used the land in one way. I, I'm very uneasy about any sort of compulsory purchase, uh, purchases. That, that seems to me quite a troubling way um, to, to go on in a, in a democracy. So, so I, I would think sensitivity and discussion um, so that people locally think it's a good idea as well but then I think it's a great opportunity and I think actually forestry is a great career for people and getting out planting trees um is 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 a you know very very good thing in all sorts of in all sorts of different ways um but you you probably um know a lot about it anyway and have have your own kind of take on this I should imagine oh well yeah no it's something I think about a lot um but I think I think you put your finger on it about it being a kind of cultural thing I mean, there's 101 good reasons why we need more trees, of course, but it, it's, uh, I mean, as you, as you describe in the book, it's a cultural, a part of a cultural landscape. And that, you know, we need to address that as well as, as well as the planting. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Robin. Um, there's a question that's come in, which I think um, is quite interesting from, from Kitty. Uh, Kitty, if you'd like to just um, unmute yourself and put your camera on. Lovely. Hello Thank there, you. Fiona. Oh, it's just a Hello. question. Are you good at identifying different types of trees in the, out there in the field? And, and did you get better while, while producing the book? Well, I think in the present company, I would be very um, nervous about saying, oh yes, <laughs> I can identify, I can identify any trees. I mean, I, I think I'm sort of, okay at it um uh you know i i kind of look at look at the shape of trees and look at their leaves and the normal kinds of things and i can tell mo you know most of them apart um but yeah i certainly got much more sensitized to it um and, and thinking about um what what kind of willow it is or what kind of poplar and that and those those sorts of sorts of questions um and and i do find that yeah because of getting much more conscious of it and thinking about what what particular shapes trees have and how tall they are and which ones grow together and those those sort of things i do now find myself um just just kind of reading a hedge or a, or a wood and sort of identifying different ones so so in some ways it's, it's like anything that you you start to know more about it changes the way you you perceive something and in some ways that's a that's a good thing because um, you're spotting different things and in other ways it it can make a walk in the wood a kind of an analytical thing rather than a, a kind of you know more emotional thing so so I think it, it has 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 different sides um, but but I, I I do find it absolutely fascinating yeah which 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 trees which and and what they do and I'm sure you could um, produce a picture of one and I would get it wrong but you know <laughs> I do, I do my best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go back to Jez in just a minute. Um, Baljinda has um, come up with not a question, uh, but a comment. I don't know, Baljinda, if you want to 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 say to to see if Fiona's heard of the same same book that you're talking about. If you'd like to unmute yourself, if you're there. No, not there at the moment. Okay, so um, for now we're. We'll turn back to Jez. Jez, if you'd like to come back in on the conversation. Sorry, Fiona, it's the awkward squad here again. Uh, but actually, this question might be for you and for Simon and Kitty and uh, Wendy and Claire, in fact. Um, so I, I find this conversation 
fascinating and stimulating and sort of, I don't know, sort of thing that excites me about forestry. Um, and I think your book and this kind of conversation um, should be pushed to a wider audience. As, but yet a lot of our cultural connection work and research and conversation is very social sciencey rather mm -hmm. than a deeper delve into cultural connection. So I suppose the question is, how can we take this kind of conversation and your kind of book, other than selling more books, hopefully, to a much wider audience? And I suppose the question for all the RFS people there is, is does the RFS have a role in that potentially? Um, well, obviously, <laughs> I've been asked if lots of people buy my book, but um, I, I, I think that I think the point about the cultural dimensions of trees um, is actually a really important one, and especially at the moment where there is funding for for, for projects, and you know the powers that be are thinking about about trees um, because I think very often the conversation is a bit utilitarian or it can be it can be medical and all of that and that's fine I mean you know that the, the benefits of of trees um, to to mental health and to you know um, the quality of cities and all of that I think is terribly important as well as all the carbon capture and all the things we just talked about um, but I do think that their their cultural associations are important but also just really really interesting i mean that, that that's the thing just get just going back to um you know wendy quoted me right at the beginning about how well if i thought it was a surprising it might be surprising someone else and therefore interesting i just think trees are so interesting um and i think if if more people kind of thought about them and knew a bit more that they would also find them interesting and and i do think they are really really important um psychologically to people as part of their place and part of their part of their home and it's not just a rural thing I think this is a big mistake people often make sometimes you talk to people and they say oh well I live in a I live in town so I don't know anything about trees and I never see any trees and and that is just that they they're not seeing what's in front of them because you know a lot of British cities are actually full of trees and London as we know is, is kind of technically a forest um, that, that you know there are millions of trees in London um, and I think just just drawing attention to that is very is, is very, very helpful. And, and you can see it if you're, if you're in London, if you walk along the South Bank, there aren't that many trees, but wherever there are trees, you see people, they are naturally gravitate towards trees, even if they're not necessarily thinking about it. And it's not just because it's a hot day um, and they want a bit of shade. I think people just are drawn to living things especially if they're in an urban environment so 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 i think i think you know irrespective of planting big forests across the country which obviously is a great importance to everybody here i think actually um just raising awareness of trees that are around people who are living in cities and towns and how interesting they are they're just as interesting as the as the architecture or the buildings or any other kind of you know local story um so thank you. I, think, I think it's a question that we can we can certainly come back to, um, Jez, and and yeah, look at look at how we expand it. Um, I just want to go back very briefly, and I think this will have to be the last one, uh, to Baljinda and her her um, well comment stroke query, I suppose. I don't know if this is something that Fiona has heard of. So Baljinda, over to you. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so it was really just a question around a book I'm reading at the moment called Braiding Sweet Grass. And I don't know if you've heard of it or read it um and i guess and it you know in the book's really talking about um indigenous people's perspectives on trees and nature in general and the men and at the moment the chapter i'm reading is the author talks about how in the english language you don't often have the language to kind of really you know kind of that like, kind of really make the most out of nature that we have around us and you know, there's something around the language we have and use, using that language to kind of really form that deep connection with, with nature and trees. And I guess that kind of touches a little bit on Jeremy's comment as well. How do we bring this to, to the wider audience? Just be really interested to explore your thoughts around that. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, d I don't know the book um, that you're uh, referring to. So if you've put it in the chat, that means I can, I can go and read it, which would be really, really helpful because it's always really interesting to, to hear about, um, you know, 
books that that you haven't come across that that are on these kinds of questions but yeah i think i think that that question of language is very very important um, I mean, I think actually the English language is very rich. Um, it's just that perhaps some of the some of the words associated with trees, because people feel that they don't know a lot about trees. Again, in the forestry society, obviously people do, but a lot of people don't, and they don't know what the different bits of trees are called or what the seeds are called, or, or all of those things. I think it's more a question of. Um, familiarizing people with language that is has now either become specialized or or has has been lost because i i think that's what's interesting about reading someone like Tar hardy a 19th century writer or if you read john clare for example early 19th century writer he uses a lot of dialect words um and they now need to be glossed and some of them you know we don't know what they are lots of his names um for flowers he calls things like um field poppies headaches um and that's something that you know, actually, it's a really kind of interesting, interesting word for a poppy, um, but it's not in it's not in common use. So, so I think there are ways in which the language has uh, has receded a bit um, in in the in you know in terms of the natural world, or become very specialised and very scientific. Um, so I agree with you. I, I think actually reviving some of the words that were once you know in common use that people knew what they meant um, and, and and sort of enriching re-enriching the language with with, with that vocabulary because i think it has been here but as you, as you say it's um it, it's now not accessible um to, to 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 many people um but that's very interesting to compare it with other other cultures and and the kind of uh, language and the way people talk about things because often in different languages as, as i'm sure you know um people have a different vocabulary and a different way of thinking about things. So it might be more metaphorical um, or, you know, there might be different kind of color words and those sorts of things. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a really good question and really interesting, thank you. Right, I'm, I'm going to start wrapping things up very shortly. I'm just going to take a couple of points uh, from, from the chat. Uh, one is that, um, you weren't the only person. Uh, Mary Larson has also taught, said she's reading Braiding Sweetgrass as well. So perhaps that's one we all need to look at. Um, and I'm picking up on a point that Jez has made. Um, Jez, just to say we are recording this and that future RFS uh, book clubs, we hope to open to a wider audience. As this was our inaugural one, we felt it was um, important to keep it to RFS only. Um, and uh, see, see how it went. So um, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Fiona, you've been talking an awful lot this evening and I'm just gonna ask you, um, and thank you so much for all that you have said and all your time. Um, I know that you have a new book out called, or it may not be new now, The Brief Life of Flowers, and you've referred to the Everyman's Collection of Trees, which I know you're contributing to. Uh, do you want to just say a quick word about both of those and how people can perhaps get hold of them if they'd like to to read them? Oh well, that's that's very kind. <clears throat> yeah, the brief life of flowers um, came out a year or two ago, and and it's it, it relates to the trees. Um, you know that there are in fact um, there is an elder, <laughs> elder in there because I'm talking about it about its blossom. Um, but I'm really looking at flowers in a similar way to the way I'm looking at trees and, and thinking about. Um, flowers that people are familiar with, but their cultural associations, the, you know, the, their medicinal properties. So, so it's similar in format to, uh, to the trees. But the collection of short stories, um, all I'm doing is selecting them. Um, I, haven't, I haven't written anything except a very short preface. Um, so, but hopefully that will be something that pe people would find interesting. And it's actually quite international as well. So it's not just, I mean, it, it, all the stories are in English, but they're about trees and they are, yeah, as I say, from, from all over the world and from different different times. And they just give us lots and lots of different takes on the human relationship with trees, which is sometimes um, actually <laughs> quite quite conflicted and other times um, you know very, very very sort of much more much more positive so um, that there's lots of different aspects there in these in these short stories but the main thing is that I think they're all really well written stories and they're full of surprises um, and, and they're things I enjoyed reading so hopefully people will like that it's not out yet I think it's coming out in the autumn. Lovely we'll look forward to that um, I'm going to hand over to Claire just to close close the meeting um, I've, 
I'll, I'll, I'll let Claire talk about where we're going next and feedback. So yeah, over to you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. That was that was really interesting. Really appreciate it. What a brilliant way to start our uh, our book club. Um, and it was just to say to everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, our next book club is on the 29th of April with Keith Kirby, who's been with us this evening um, on his book, Europe's Changing Woods and Forests. Uh, it's a book that brings together research, which will be of interest to all those thinking about woodlands and trees and how they'll look in the future. So please join us for that. There are still tickets available and also discounts on Keith's book, If You Book. So all good. Um, and as I said at the beginning, we'll circulate a recording of the session. Um, there'll be an opportunity to give us feedback and we would welcome any ideas you might have for future sessions. So thank you so much. Um, and thanks, Fiona. And have a lovely rest of the evening, everybody. We'll close the session there. Lovely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>